Hi there guys, I'm Chris Bowden and welcome to the Geek Group. We're here today for an equipment autopsy of an IBM Correcting Selectric 3. The sexiest thing the 80s had to offer from IBM. So this is just a giant tank of a typewriter and I'm kind of excited about it. We did the daisy wheel thing, now we're doing the ball. Because I mentioned this, does it do anything? Is there an on switch? A crank perhaps? Ooh, oh, that can't be good. All right, well, it's not going to power. Oh, there's an on switch there. Hello, computer. Well, we can get that right out of the way to start with. Screwdrivers are in the second drawer. I really, I got to work on that. Start by taking off the hood. So we explored the daisy wheel printer. And back when we did that, I said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we did the ball, the type ball? Yeah, we don't need that. And we got a type ball. In fact, I have a type ball. Right here. There's the type ball. This is Prestige Elite 96. 12 point, I think, because there's a 12. But that little tiny ball holds all of the characters. This is a really big deal. And the reason why is in doing that, in having that, it let things happen with a typewriter that weren't possible before that. Because you don't have all the levers with individual characters on them, everything's on the ball. So this means the levers can't jam up because if you try and send two levers down at once, they jam up. We should do a regular typewriter and talk about that. That'd be kind of cool. Another big thing that happens with this is with an old, old style typewriter, as you type, the carriage goes way out and back, and way out and back, right? So you can't have anything on your desk here because it'll knock it over. This is a big deal that everything is contained inside this. It was such a big deal that when they first started selling these, they expected to sell like 50, maybe 60 in a month. They sold 500 to 600 a month. It was insane. The, the IBM Selectric absolutely revolutionized the whole concept of typewriters and they became just ubiquitous. And this started back in the 60s. Now this machine, because it has the correcting ribbon here, so you can erase mistakes, another really big deal. We know that this one was made after the early 70s. I think this came out in like 1973. And because this is a Selectric 3, um, that tells me it's the last generation of them. So this one probably came from the 80s at some point. So that gives us a rough idea on the dates on it. I'm going to try taking some things out. We've got the ball, which is the holy grail of the machine. This is, this is the awesomeness. So I'm going to set that aside over there. We're keeping that. And we'll try and take the ribbon out. I've never done this before, but I am totally a trained professional. And really, how hard can it be? What am I going to do? Break it? Oh, well, that moved that. I get half of it. Can I have the other half? It'd be pretty cool if I could have like the whole thing. Somewhere there's a 60 year old woman who's done this 10 million times, professional typist, and she's mocking me so hard. Oh, that did that. You gotta come out. Unhook there, unhook there. Ah, 
My tape's all messed up. How will I fix this? Whatever can, oh, that, that's stuck under the thing. Watch, you can, and you can see three rows of writing on there. In fact, it is possible to go backwards through a typewriter ribbon to like take one out of the trash and use it for gathering intelligence data by going through the used part of the ribbon and recompiling all the information that was typed. I don't know how well that would work on here because you've got the three layers of stuff, but I'm sure somebody can do it. Those guys at the NSA, lots of money, infinite resources, lots of free time. But this is our ribbon, which is just a supply reel, a take-up reel, and it's got, it's got the little thing here so you can fast forward it and stuff. Then we've got the correction ribbon here, which is not going to come out so easily, but let's see what we can do. Ah, okay, that's just a friction fit. Here's our take-up side. We can see what they screwed up typing. All of your mistakes saved forever. Kind of like YouTube. Now we're into the mechanism of it, and this is insane. So I'm looking at that, and I'm thinking, wow, this is going to take a minute. So I really wish this worked. I can't. I've been trying to see if I could find something that was making it angry so that we could make it work because man wouldn't it be cool if we could fire this up and show stuff moving around. Now I found some latches there. That's how I move that but I have to take, well, maybe I just got to take those off to do this. All right, well let's see if we can take those off. That's a Allen head. And I've got some pretty tiny Allen heads over here, about that size. Maybe? Oh, I think I got it. This is a little tricky because my bit is too short for this particular tool, so it just kind of... Oh, no, I'm cool there. All right, I got this. Okay, take that out, and then we'll do this side. Okay, just a couple little grub screws there. That comes off. Now, is that all that's holding it? Oh, yeah. Oh, the that gummy stuff probably not supposed to get rid of you. All right, now we're down to, the, hey, there's a bell. Bell. Shut up, I like simple pleasures. All right, so. We're all gunged up. I bet there's a motor somewhere that may not be spinning and wants to. Hey, big motor in the back. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. I'm pretty sure the motor's not supposed to do that. Oh, this is cool. So, a lot of the keys are stuck down. <laughs> I really have all the makings for a Kraftwerk album happening here. So there's this foam down here under the keys that looks like this. And it's, if you've ever dealt with rotten speaker surround rings, it's the same kind of thing. It's all just 
greasy and crumbly and it's it's under the keys here I'm guessing is like a dust collecting layer and it's got everything all gunged up so like if I push a key down it just hangs like these it's all just mush But I got the motor moving, the motor was all gummed up. So that's something. And it just sounds like a printing press. Alright. I'm gonna try... Let's pop the keys off and see if that helps. I'm gonna do all of this while it's running as long as possible. Yeah. So the keys on this do not come off like a regular modern day keyboard. These are, these are on here substantially. Hmm. Now we go top in. We'll just end up at the keyboard. I don't think I'm going to be able to get this. Oh, I can't do that. I don't think I'm going to be able to get this to just where I can make it type. I, I think it's... I think it would require somebody who's much more knowledgeable of the mechanism than I am and who has a lot more time to put into this than I do. And it's not a worthwhile artifact to do that level of effort to. It's cool, but it ain't that cool. Also, it's really easy to find these because they made a bajillion of them. But if you've got a kid who's into taking stuff apart, I totally suggest hitting a Salvation Army and getting one of these because, man, they're full of parts. I'm going to go in and end. There's our impression cylinder, I guess. Motor's doing better and better the longer it runs. What holds you in there? Oh, didn't need that, obviously. So, this is neat. I'm trying to figure out this piece right here, this long shaft, has these little fingers on it, and they're not precisely spaced, and they're movable. I'm trying to figure out what these do. But when I move this shaft, this clear Set, oh, it moved, okay, clear and set moves that. I think this has to do with setting tabs or margins. Because it looks like you'd come in and this little thing would hit that. It's amazing to think that a lot of the stuff we do in document creation today was once done in hardware. Like, we just take WYSIWYG editors for granted now. That was a really big deal. Like it was a really big deal with this typewriter that you could change the font. And now that's, that's nothing. You just, you can go to websites and find thousands of fonts that you can download. But these go back to 1961. The, the first Selectrix came out in 1961. The, one of the engineers on it 
considered it a major failure because all the control systems in this work for a very specific set of instructions for key codes and stuff. And he wanted really bad for it to use ASCII because if it used ASCII, this could have been used for early computers. And some of them were, but there was, there was some hacking involved, of course. That is an irrationally long screw. But he never got it to work natively with ASCII because of just design choices at the time, because those computer things, they're not going to go anywhere. Not with IBM. What will they ever do with computers? Got just about everything I can out of this end. I think I can get that one. The parts in this, like you get into stuff like this and that's two different stampings. As a subassembly, like somebody had to put, the, put it together, there's, there's somebody whose job is to put that spring in there on an assembly line somewhere. So just that little thing, I mean, we've got a pretty generic spring. And then this, and these, these are all, they have to fit and glide and work together just so. Like that part took a lot of work to make. That's, that's all stamped. That started out as just a flat piece of metal. And this one's stamped out and a little bend to it. But this is not an off the shelf part. This part was built just for this machine. Like things like, nuts and bolts and screws and like the little rollers in here that there's a company that makes the rollers and you pick the one you want out of a catalog and off you go. But most of this machine, I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of parts here and they're all different and, and they're all absolutely only used for just this machine and they're custom built by a factory just for that. And that's on the surface, that's hard to do. And then you get into, well, we have to sell these too. So it can't, because it's easy to have a big, complicated machine made entirely out of custom parts, but you do stuff like that, and you tend to be working with defense department level of budgets. You know, space shuttle stuff. It's like, yeah, it's no, it's no problem. It's got 10,000 different parts, and they're all custom made to crazy high tolerances and cost of fortune. That's fine. Let's buy three of them. But with this, you got to sell these to somebody, which means they got to be affordable. That screw just keeps on coming. It's another one of those giant ones. I got some big gears over here. Oh, now we're getting real important, expensive stuff falling out now. But a lot of it's just like, okay, there's a sleeve. So as I go through this, if I don't talk about every part, don't, don't get upset because I'll, all I'm doing is taking out screws. And there's, it's nothing, this is an amazing, complicated, beautiful machine made of 10,000 very boring, simple little parts. And now we go to the other side. You'll come upon snap rings on a pretty regular basis. And they tend to be a bit of a pain to get off, and this is why. Sometimes you got to get a bit behind them. 
because I can't get into this snap ring enough. So just very, very gently get in behind it and see if that Oh, I got it moving now. There. So this is a snap ring. I'll hold it right there. This is a snap ring. And they work, the, the pliers for it actually work backwards. As I squeeze the pliers, they open it up like that. And these want to go flying off in random directions when removed. Okay, I'm gonna unplug it at this point because now I'm getting into things that wanna eat my fingers. I like having fingers. We're gonna see if we can get the whole carriage assembly right out of there because I almost got it. So when I put my arm over this, that motor's hot. Like there's, there's heat coming off. Oh, another sear clip. Let me get this one out. That might be the one part that was, ah, yeah. Okay, now that's moving, and we're hanging up by one thing. Oh, that did that. Okay, so there's basically our registration table. I'm just working parts of this because they haven't moved in forever, and you move it the first time, it's like, and then you get, okay, well, that's, that's free and easy now. I think the biggest enemy of, like, what killed this old machine is simply time and sitting still. Lack of use. This is neat. I like this part. See if I can get those out. Take that out. I should be able to lift that right through. There's that neat bar. Look at that. So this just looks like a simple bar with some pins on it, but realize all of these move individually. So this bar is an assembly of a lot of parts. I'm gonna see if I can get it apart for you guys. So we take that off. So here, we've got one part there, the clip, the nut, the bracket, the, there's a grub screw here. So there's three parts in my hand plus the clip. Then we've got this. I think. things running away on me. I think the shaft is pressed together. I'm trying not to smack it too hard. Oh 
you just got to go like another. Oh, no, I got one. There we go. All right. Look right here. This just came out of there. You can see that is the end piece of all the little widgy bits in here. I might be able to get another one out. Yeah, I got a few. Here, look, you can see them. There's the end piece, and that's what the center ones look like. Those are all individual stamp parts. And there's a lot of them in there. To get them all out, you'd have to drive that whole pin out of the inside. I think the pin's what keeps them in. Yeah. So that's a whole, there's, I don't know, 50 or 60 of these, maybe more, plus the plastic tips, plus the shaft. The shaft is all precision cut. Look at that. How'd they do that? Bandsaw? Wire EDM? Just the effort that went into manufacturing this is amazing. This is a neat machine. Some of you might think, don't you feel bad taking it apart? Not even a little bit. It's full of parts and it's fun. And it's neat. And one of these springs will probably end up fixing a carburetor on some kid's motorcycle. Because all the parts here will end up in stock here at the lab. Another complicated stamp part. This has a pin swaged into it. So it's built on a big solid base. This is cast. Let's try and take it out of its housing a bit. Maybe I can get into there. That is so nasty. So here's up from below. That's kind of a cool shot. A lot of mechanism bits. And this is the matrix. And just like pretty much any other typewriter, you can see there's this really intricate, complicated matrix of levers. It's all levers for each key press. These, I think, here are perhaps, because they look like springs, they're that blued steel. I think those might be the key return springs. Let's get in and have a look. Everything up here is covered in just schmoo. Well, they're jumping out like springs. And there's layers of them. So that's neat. That's a spring. And they're very soft, very light springs. So I think that's why the keys aren't going back up, because this is all the force there is to push them back. And they're fighting a very heavy layer of gunge. Just old sticky oil and all of that foam junk. If you took this whole thing and just soaked it in like kerosene for a month, it might live again. Some serious gears. And a really nice assembly for them. These are all on the main drive side over here. But I want to get, I wonder what happens now if we plug it in. Well, you can see things happening in there now. 
you can see the motor turning a drive belt here. Oh, that's cool. Check that out. What I'd like to do is figure out how to make something over here work because there's a there's a differential. I don't know if you can see it. It's buried down in there, but there's a whole differential setup. Okay, fingers back in. What screws can I get out while I'm over here? Oh, once I tear into the key matrix, it's gonna it's gonna get a little nuts. There's a cool spring. Check that out. That's a neat design. That's pretty useful for a lot of other things. You could use that for uh, a lot of little stuff with uh, like an idler wheel or something like that. And this one's a good example too. Check this out. We've got, this is a pulley here that's on a piece of cable inside. It's like a plastic cable. It's kind of cool. I'll dig that out in a second. But this is on a little custom slider assembly. And it's got two big springs. Now the springs, when this was installed, were bent back on themselves like this in a big arch. It's really hard to do. But these, these were bent all the way over, and it was pushing this out. And that's how it was tensioning it. I want to meet the engineer who came up with that system for designing that part, because whoever designed this part was a cool guy. Oh, finally. Get that thing out of there. I've been trying to get that part out for like 10 minutes now. now I, oh, wow. Look at this. What's this? What is this? I've got a little metal belt. Could also be referred to as a razor blade. Runs around on this little flat bottom pulley. And it, it's really tiny, really sharp comes out this side over here. Just the engineering on this is like watchmaker levels of stuff. Can I get you out? As we go past the uncomfortably warm motor. Oh, really? All right, I got to show you this. Let me pull this part out here. This is neat. This is neat. All right. Look at this part. I've got a Z bend on the end here, and I've got a clevis. And this clevis is a pin on one side, and there's a hole that goes all the way through. And this is a piece of just, it springs out a little bit, so you can loop it on the thing. Notice that this clevis can be adjusted. If I turn this shaft, it's threaded here, so you can adjust it for the length of the clevis. This exact setup, like exactly, with the Z-bend, the metal shaft, the threaded clevis, the little thing here where you bend the part out, that is found all over in the world of model aircraft. That's pretty much the standard connection to every control surface on a model airplane. For like ailerons, elevators, rudders, all kinds of stuff. That's that whole part. I'm setting this one aside because we're going to talk about that in a future video at some point. That, that deserves its own thing. That's really neat. So either 
that was a standard back in this time of engineering, which is possible. I don't know. I've never seen it anywhere else. Or the engineer who made that particular part was very familiar with model airplanes, which is entirely possible. I'm not saying that there might be some crossover between nerds that are mechanical engineers that have a background in mechanisms and model aircraft. We don't know anybody like that, Sam. But that was kind of cool to find. All right, let's dig in. So now that I got that stuff out, I can get this stuff out. And there's a bunch of really big, beefy sub-assemblies down under here, deep within the superstructure. And that's what I want to get to. That's what I want to check out. I want to get down to where we can really explore the, the matrix there. Ah, you're too big for that. You're not going to move, are you? You're just going to... Oh, you'll move. So I did that whole thing, and I got nothing for it. OK. But you're not holding anything in. I don't think. Yeah, it's just sitting there. And you come out the back, okay. Nice plastic gear, over-molded plastic gear on a metal. You can see the little spikes there to keep it properly on. It's a really well-designed gear. Okay, so we've got the big plastic cable here. We've got a little razor blade cable here. We've got another razor blade cable here. There's a lot of cables going back and forth, belts. Really, I think the metal, the metal ones count as a metal belt. This spring clips on, so you got to bend that around to get it off. can't be this simple. It is. Got it. So there's the shaft. And now that that's out, there really can't be a whole lot that's left to hold that in there. That was fun, but we got it. Oh wow, look at that. You can see the little tiny ball bearings in there. I don't want to know what that cost to make. So that's caught on there. That's really, that thing wants to slice me apart.
This one nut in here is copper. I don't know why, but it's different from all the others. Is it a bearing surface? Is it, is it bronze or something? There's a whole little tiny intricate assembly. Like there's a million parts right here. And I haven't been able to figure out why, but it has something to do with the carriage, the positioning of the carriage. There's a lot going on with it. Little, like that's a tiny little spring there. I can't really get a grip on this. And I think if I go to, oh, wait, I might have a pair of pliers small enough. Yeah, the whole nut's turning, or the whole bolt's turning from below. All right, we're going to have to dig into this. Huh? Oh! Oh! Moment of glory! Glory and victory! Where do you attach? Deep with inside, okay. So, I'm going to have to cut it. Whoa! Okay, that razor blade ribbon thing? One of them pulls this, this white cam. You can see that there. It's like a puppet. And the other one goes around a spring mechanism here, like a clock spring. I'm gonna try and take that out. Let's cut the other ones while we're in there. Okay, so you'll, you'll come out. You're out. That's a spring. Uh, it's a spring with an end on it. That's got a cable in it that, okay, so the spring here is a guide. There's a cable down the inside, like a, a bicycle brake line. So I should be able, there's a screw, just like a bicycle brake line. And I need, a tinier screwdriver than that. This tiny? There we go. It's so intricate. It's really, this is art. This is high art. And these guys that did this because I'm not being sexist and saying that. I mean, this is IBM in the 60s. This is all guys that wear white shirts and skinny black ties and have crew cuts. It's IBM. And the guys that did this, nobody knows their names. Nobody sees this art. This took years to design and then more years to perfect. Nobody knows who these guys are. Nobody remembers these guys. And this art, this... Alexander Calder slapped half a dozen pieces of steel together, painted it orange, and it became such an icon for the city of Grand Rapids that it's on our street signs. There's a dozen people that spent years building this, building just, just this assembly of parts, and nobody knows their names. This is art. This is... It's engineering, it's design, but it's very much art. There is elegance in this. And this is stuff that should be explored. This is stuff that should be remembered. Because this, when people are talking about, you know, let's make America great again, this 
had a huge part in making us great in the first place. This level of intricacy and in design and engineering. And it's all around you. It's everywhere. This was rotting away in a Salvation Army thrift shop. Five bucks. But it's in there, and it should be appreciated. Somebody should just take a minute and take it apart and go, wow, look at that. That's all. Just, just appreciate the miracle that that is. Because that huge amount of mechanical engineering is now a couple pieces of silicon in your back pocket. It took all this to be able to have delete and have different fonts and, and change the size of your font. All that. Now it's 20 lines of code. It's kind of neat to look back at where we started to appreciate just how big a deal it is where we are today. Because understanding the work that it took to get there goes a long way towards appreciating the miracles that you take for granted every day. Hmm. Oh, you're going to be a bother. Let's just reef on it. So you see, on here, you can see all those numbers, those three million numbers, those are patents. That is, I had an original idea. Check this out. Those are bragging rights. And the guys that work on this stuff, the engineers that design and build this stuff, they get their name on those patents. You know, Bob comes up with a cool thing, gets his name on it. I did that. That was my idea. I got paperwork to prove it. And there's a lot of bragging rights inside this machine. Now look at that. That is what I was trying to show you from above. Now we're down into the real mechanism of it all. So now, Let's try and tidy up some of these loose bits because I don't want it to eat me if it gets the chance, because it will. This is old school. This machine has no forgiveness and will eat a finger the moment I give it the chance. I think, while I know it's highly dangerous and relatively stupid, I'm going to plug this in and see what happens and see if we can make it do anything. Oh, wow. All kinds of stuff going on. All right. What does it take? To make this engage, this is this really nifty differential thing going on here. I want to make that work. And what's going on here? What is this? Oh, there's a clock spring wound up in here. This whole thing's a clock spring, and it's just sitting there, and it's going to explode if I keep poking it. So let's keep poking it. Let's see if I can get this out without eating it or having it just let go in my hand. I'll try and remove the switch here too because that's really all that's holding that. Let's unplug it before we go messing with the back side of the switch because that's hot. That's really hot. Well, the switch is just mounted with that screw. I can get that out with this. Okay. Okay, maybe two screws. Okay. Now I can get that whole spring out of there, so this is now not going to explode and eat my face. So there's a clock spring in a cage. And 
now, oh, isn't going to work because I unplugged it for safety. Safety. That's kind of neat. I moved this little lever back here in the on-off switch way out there moves. And look down at the bottom. There's another one of those clevis arrangements. So now my question is, because I'm pretty sure the typewriter predates the model airplane, is did the model airplane culture steal that from typewriters? Or did this typewriter steal that from the model airplane culture? That's, this is a question I have, and I'm going to have to do some digging. So I can take that greasy, nasty thing out. And I can get, are you going to, are you going to give that up easily? Or are you going to fight me? You fight me a little bit. Okay. And that falls out the bottom. There are so many springs of a million different types in here. But I want, very badly, Oh, hey, check this out. Watch really closely right here. And you'll see there's a centrifugal clutch on the motor. This is kind of neat. See the spring? When this spins fast enough, this little bit flies out. And this one flies out. And it engages here. This gives the motor the opportunity to come up to speed before the belt engages. Once this crosses a certain speed, the centrifugal force flings these out and it engages a clutch. Watch, you'll see the motor start spinning before the belt starts moving, if you watch right here. I'm gonna move this, and maybe you guys can see it better. You wanna look right here. You ready? See how the motor spins up before things start moving? So, I'm going to unplug it now because I just started getting little wisps of smoke. <laughs> so I've made something angry. I'm not entirely sure what, but it seemed to be coming from over by the switch. <laughs> and now there's a bad smell. <laughs> so I think, I think we've pushed that as far as we can. And now we're just down into a purely mechanical system of a burned out switch, a tired old motor, and a million little levers. But there's really nothing more to it to take apart. Like I could spend an hour just taking this apart, but we're not really going to get anywhere and all we're going to learn about is, is a lot more on those clevises. I wanted to get down into the differential in here, which I can see and I still don't understand. And I really think it's going to take me another hour of shooting video to be able to figure that out because the differential in there is really neat. There, there's, a, there's, there's a transmission in here and I kind of want to know how that works and I, wanna, I really want to understand it, but it's so complicated. There's so much intricate mechanism in this that it would easily, easily take me the next hour of my life just to, just to figure that out. And I don't want to know that bad. So I think that's about as far as we're going to get into this. But there is one last part I definitely have to take out. Because from this whole machine, I'm going to save that one little piece. I got the bell. So that is the autopsy of the IBM Selectric Model 3 from somewhere in the 1980s. Had to be before 1986 because that's when they discontinued the brand. 
And that was pretty cool. That was, that was a lot. This poor old machine can finally live on in a million other mechanisms now here at the lab because we got all kinds of fun parts out of it. You guys have fun, keep exploring stuff, and save the interesting bits for your own self. I'm Chris Bowden, and as always, we'll see you next time.